Hello. Welcome to the deep canvassing training with the Missouri chapter of the Sierra Club. My name is Gretchen Waddell Barwick, and I'm the chapter director here in Missouri. That means I oversee all the work that happens in Missouri. I'm also a lifelong Missourian um, with a few years living in Kansas, but I was born in Springfield, grew up in Kansas City, went to college in Columbia, married a guy from the Boot Hill, and now live in St. Louis. I'm happy to be here with you today and talk to you about deep canvassing and what we're doing um, and the issues that we have at hand. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us at any time. You can always reach the Missouri chapter at missouri.chapter at sierraclub.org. And you can contact us at 314-644-1011. I'm excited to go deep canvassing with you and talk to you about what we're learning today. So why are we here? In Kansas City, the Hawthorne coal plant is poisoning our community. The Hawthorne coal fire power plant emits nearly 3 million tons of carbon dioxide, NOx, and sulfur dioxide air pollution into our community. And in the neighborhoods in the three miles surrounding Hawthorne, that is a community that is 44% people of color and more than one third of those folks live in poverty. Research has shown that low income communities and communities of color are significantly more likely to be impacted by the health outcomes of coal fired power pollution. And we know that we need to move to a clean and renewable energy future in order to address the issues of climate change in our community. So closing the Hawthorne coal plant is an important step towards our clean energy future, and it's an important step in the equity and stability and health of our community. Part of what we're doing is deep canvassing to get people involved in the work that we're doing. Some of you may be familiar with traditional canvassing, which some people call knock and drag. That's where you walk up to someone's door and you say, hi, my name's Gretchen, and I'm asking if you'll vote for Jane Smith for governor. Do you have a plan to go vote? Would you like a yard sign? Research has shown that that makes very small changes in behavior for a short period of time. But deep canvassing is different. It's creating mutual understanding and lived experiences. It's longer conversations where we listen non-judgmentally and invite people to share their real and conflicted emotions and feelings about an issue. We share our own stories, our own vulnerability, and build relationships so that we can achieve what we want to together. Research has shown that deep canvassing is more than 100% more effective than traditional canvassing and lasts much longer. By shifting our emotions and beliefs, we can change how people think in a lasting way. And we're training folks today to ask questions and listen rather than just share facts and figures or to debate, which is so often how our conversations about political or social issues happen. But we know that there's a better way and the research has proven us correct. So let's watch an example of what deep canvassing looks like. This is another issue, it's not environmental. And I do wanna give a quick, trigger warning for this. There are some harmful terms used. Um, and so if you are going to be concerned by that, please feel free to fast forward through this bit while we watch this video. And to be a little more specific, if we were on a scale from zero to 10, where zero is you're 100% against, 10 is 100% in favor of including them in the law discrimination laws, and five is somewhere in the middle, and then you have your whole scale there. Where do you think you'd put yourself? Mm -hmm. Six. Six, okay. What would be a reason you would vote for it, and what would be a reason you wouldn't vote for it? Well, be the reason I would is because I'm not judgmental. It's sure. Everybody has their own preference. Sure. There's no reason why I wouldn't vote for it, but I wouldn't want that around children. Mm -hmm. People could pretend to be and go after our kids. I mean, mm -hmm. that's something big to think about, and that probably would change a lot of people's minds. Do you know someone who yes, is transgender? I, I have 
someone in our family. So is transgender? Mm-hmm. Um, cool. How are you? How are you related to them? It's my nephew. Your well, nephew. Or niece, nephew. Niece. Whatever. Niece. Okay. Okay. So she. Um, he was born a boy, and, uh, but he wants to be a girl. Okay. Has how much has she talked to you about that at all? Um, actually, that's funny because um, he felt like uh, I'm not quite comfortable with it, so mm-hmm. he stopped talking to me because. Seeing him with the wig, I mean, with the hair and the lipstick, and it's hard when you, sure. when you, when I raised him when he was a baby, he was a boy. I mean, it was, but he felt like I don't accept it. Right. Do you know why um, they feel that way? I don't. Right. That's something I want. I would want to know because, right. like I said, I don't try to judge anybody. Their preference is their preference. And so your your niece, what would, or. What name is she asking you? That's another thing. His mm-hmm. name was his name, and the name that he's going by is. I, I have a, a friend um, who was in kind of a similar situation, I suppose. So this is my friend um, on the left, um, okay. one of my best friends. Great guy, great guy, and he um, he is transgender. So he was born a girl. He was raised as a girl, and you know I think what's really important was that it really like it wasn't his body that matters so much, it doesn't matter what body looks like, he's still definitely a boy, but he really wanted his body to reflect that, and to feel very real to him, and he got his chest flattened, and um, he was really excited about it, he took a bunch of selfies of himself you know, with his flattened chest, he, he sent a picture back to one of his best friends from high school, and she said, like, she just wasn't expecting it, and I, I think it really caught her off guard, and she said, oh, what, that's, that's really weird, and he had been so excited about that surgery, and that, it really hurt him, I think, to hear his friend react that way. Wow. Um, Maybe that's the way I kind of reacted towards him without saying it, but the way I guess I was acting. As mm-hmm. if, it's like, don't come around me. That's really weird. I, I couldn't, honestly, I mean, no one Now you make me feel bad because... No, 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 I'm, I'm definitely not trying to... I mean... I think it's really complicated. I didn't even think about it like that. Like, if I was in his position, mm-hmm. it's kind of hard to, mm-hmm. you know. I never thought about it that way. Um, I'm wondering, is, is there a time that you ever kind of felt like you were on the receiving end of that? Like, when you ever felt different? Mm, not really. I mean, mine is totally something else. But. No, I mean, that's totally fine. I mean, I think we can all relate to that feeling of, of being judged. Oh, and so yeah. that's really relevant. The, all the time. What was yeah. like maybe a specific time? Mm. Maybe a couple of years ago, when I first moved out to LA, mm-hmm. got a lot of bad vibes here and there and sure. there and there. It totally make you feel like you're alone or yeah. You, what what were some of the things that happened? Um. Well, with this workplace that I work at, I don't really want to go into details about <laughs> that. But because I'm from somewhere else, some of the girls I feel like were like. Like didn't like me or knick knack mm-hmm. picked at me or said things like I should go back where I was at. Yeah. So a lot of that made me feel different. I'm really sorry to hear about that. I mean that must have been really Oh yeah. You're just trying to start a new job. Yeah. <laughs> it was hard. Especially when you have kids and you know, you're mm-hmm. working to provide to be a provider and you're going through all that. So a lot of things were going in my mind at that time. You know, I need the money, I need this, so I stay long, I stay longer. And suffered some of them things, but they got, they didn't get better, it got worse. I definitely remember like being, being at school and like I, I just, I started a, I'm gay. And it was really, that was, that was an important thing for me. Um, and I was the only one at my high school who was. So I started a gay straight alliance just because I kind of wanted to, see what more was happening there. But at the end of the year, I I won like a, a senior award. It was my senior year of high school, and I got an award for it. And afterwards, when I won it, and I was leaving the gym, a group of guys came up to me and said like, you don't deserve that award, like you're a fag, and like you only got that because you're gay, and because you started this club, and the administration feels like they had to like do this for oh. you. And so that, you know, and it's all kind of that same feeling of like, they see you, and you're different, and like, Felt and that's how I felt when they when they told me about that. And it sounds like you felt that way, and it sounds maybe like that way. So that's why it's really important to me 
that something like this law is on the books so that people d so doesn't have to go to work and feel like they're going to be fired because everyone's looking at them differently or mm. something like that. That's true. I think that was one of the cases too. He used to go to work as a boy, and I guess mm -hmm. he posted Facebook pages of him at work with a wig, with his with his hair, and, and he got I think he got fired for that. Yeah, and that's, so that's actually exactly what this law so that's, is is doing. Actually, is, is okay. Okay. That's that makes a lot more sense. <laughs> yeah. Right. Wow. Okay. So what's interesting about this conversation, and I really recommend watching the entire thing if you have the opportunity, is that the volunteer at the door very clearly could have taken offense to what some of the woman at the door was saying. He could have said, wow, you're not using the right terms. He could have given her a lot of facts. He could have lectured her, but what he did was listen curiously. He asked questions. He asked for her experiences and then likened them to the issue at hand. He found a place where they connected and had something in common. And the impact was that when he asked her to share and then shared something about his own life, she was willing to open up and be receptive of what he was trying to say. Um, rather than getting stuck on talking points or debating. He also made sure to not judge her for her lack of information or lack of understanding. He made sure to listen to what she was trying to say and find values where they could connect. And if you watch through the end of this video, you can see her ideas changing um, about how she's thinking about trans folks and their rights, and even thinking about her own family members and relating it back to her own life and being more understanding. Um, and the research has shown that this has long lasting impacts, but it takes a significantly longer period of time to have a conversation like this, and it takes a different skill set than traditional canvassing. And that's what we're here today to learn. So today we're going to talk a little bit about what the key components of deep canvassing are. We're going to talk about how to build this conversation and what the framework of the conversation looks like um, and how to keep things moving and how to best move forward and keep yourself safe when you're having these conversations. So how do you deep canvas? The first part is building rapport. So rapport is just being friendly to people. It's like if you go to the gas station and you tell the gas station attendant, oh, hey, I really like your nails. Or if you're walking along and you smile at somebody and you say, hey, that's a cute dog. You're going to find something to compliment them on, something to say to lower their anxiety about a stranger being in front of them and show that you are friendly and you are there with no ill intent. It increases trust and likability. It facilitates problem solving and it helps people want to communicate with you and not slam the door in your face. So make eye contact, use your hands, smile, be conscious of your posture. And then when you're talking to somebody, observe the little details, make a connection with them, be honest. People will know if you're lying to them. All of these things are ways to build rapport and how to have better conversations and lead to better outcomes. Deep canvassing is a mindset. We are not trying to change people's minds. We are not trying to convince them that we are right and they are wrong. We are not trying to fight with them or debate with them. And we're not trying to change their ideology. This is not pro-environmental versus anti-environmental. It is not Republican versus Democrat. This is, we are in a community together and people in this community are being harmed. How can we come together and address the issue and what do we have in common? Because regardless of ideology, we have more in common than we do apart. And it's important to find those threads of connection so that we can work together. If someone shows up at your door and says immediately that you're wrong about something, Think about how that would feel. 
Think about how you would react. Would you want to have a conversation with them? Would you want to listen to them? Studies show no, you would dig in your heels. You would not be interested in continuing a conversation with them. And that is the way political discourse is in this country right now. It's fighting and constant talking points back and forth. De canvassing is not about talking points. It is about understanding. It is about being curious and learning what the other person has to say. That does not mean that there isn't a framework of this conversation. There is a planned end and we wanna keep that conversation on track. And one of the best ways to keep that conversation moving and to find those threads of connection is to be curious. So you might want to open ask ask open ended questions. Tell me about a time that what would that mean for you? Why are you led to? What was that like? Can you tell me more? In the example that we just saw, the canvasser at the door said, "Have you ever felt judged like that?" Oh, well, it wasn't anything like this, but we can all appreciate that feeling. We've all felt judged. What was that like for you? And so making those connections with people and sharing and naming those emotions is a key part of the conversation of deep canvassing. This is because our beliefs are led by our emotions. Deep in the center, there is fear, or anger or mistrust. And you have to figure out what the core of that is in order to change ideology and beliefs or to get past that so that you can have a real conversation without debate. It's not enough to ask people their stories. We have to share our own. And it's not enough to just share our stories. We have to listen to the other stories. Research has shown that if we share facts and figures, it does nothing to change people's minds or hearts. If we just share our stories, there are very small, short-term changes. But when we build connection, and when we find those threads that bring us together and name our emotions and share stories back and forth, that is when we see lasting movement. We want to be patient and we want to be empathetic. Everyone's lived experience is different and valid. And we're not here to prove people wrong. But sometimes people will say things that trigger our emotional responses. So it's important to be mindful of that. And rather than jump to conclusions or become defensive, ask clarifying questions and be curious. If someone were to say something that triggers your emotions, like in the example we just showed, oh, trans people might try to get to our kids. That is a very triggering sentence for a lot of people. In the environmental movement, it might be climate change isn't real. It's just a liberal hoax. Those are just talking points. They're not at the crux of people's actual emotional responses. That's interesting. If you think climate change is a liberal hoax, what makes you say that? Is there something that you've noticed in your own experiences? I don't know about you, but there were an awful lot of excessive heat days this summer. So having conversations with people about your own experiences, not facts, not 95% of scientists agree, not we know that the earth is rapidly warming, but actually talking about lived experiences is how we continue. And practicing to not react when we are triggered that way is a skill that takes a lot of time and energy and sometimes we're going to fail and that's okay. This is another fantastic video that we'll share with you if you have the time to watch it and it's talking about how to share your story. In our framework for deep canvassing, we're asking people to share a time 
that they felt like they have made a change in their community. So what we're asking you to do is share your story of a time that you have seen your community come together or a group of people come together and make a change or a difference. Now, this doesn't have to be something major. This doesn't have to be, you know, I worked on the Bernie Sanders campaign. This doesn't have to be my entire community rallied together and we, you know, solved this huge issue, you know, poverty no longer exists in my neighborhood. That's not realistic. But thinking of a time when you experienced or witnessed a change and then sharing that story and why it was important to you, the choices that you made and why, and how the outcome changed you or your experience in life is what we want you to share. We specifically want you to have some details, some specific little tidbits that make it personal to you. We want you to name the emotions that you're feeling and why you felt them. We want you to show and not tell um, and paint a picture. So connect people to the change that they want. So I might share a story of when I got pregnant with my daughter. I had a lot of anxiety like a lot of new parents do. I wanted her to be happy. I wanted her to be safe. I wanted her to be as healthy as possible. And so I did things like making sure that I was researching the food that she was eating and being thoughtful about how I dressed her and what was in her crib and where she slept and taking her to the doctor and making sure that she had appropriate needs. And one day I took her to her pediatrician and my pediatrician told me that she needed to have, that my daughter needed to have a lead test done, a blood test because of the zip code that I live in, because of where I live, because there is so much an epidemic of lead poisoning in our water that my daughter, just by living in our house with us, had to go get tested for the level of lead in her blood. And I was horrified. And I realized that mothers all across my city were having this same conversation and parents and grandparents, and that everything that we were doing to protect our kids from negative outcomes, from things that were a danger, we couldn't protect them from this because it was in our homes. And I decided to get involved. And so I was really lucky to work with a coalition of people who helped pass a law last year to get money to schools to get lead out of our pipes for kids like my daughter who go to public school and take a water bottle every day because they can't drink the water in their own classrooms. And it passed. And Betty's school, that's my daughter, got funding. And kids are gonna have clean water and they're not gonna have to worry about lead in their schools. And that's something that made me feel like I was doing more for my community. I was protecting my daughter, but I was also protecting our world and our community and the generations that are coming after. So I want you to think about after this, what is your story? How have you seen your community come together? What role did you play? How did it make you feel? Right now, federal governments are failing to act. We all know that if we get too curious, sometimes we'll just ask questions and the conversation won't go anywhere. And that's not the point of this conversation. It's not the point of deep canvassing. It's to just chat with people on their doorsteps, although that is fun. We want to make sure that we are being assertive and redirecting the conversation towards its planned end. Again, we're not trying to persuade people, but our conversation is for a purpose. So what we want to do is when someone either starts talking talking points or they decide that they are not trying to have the conversation that you're having, follow these three points to keep the conversation moving. 
First, you affirm what you heard. Now, affirm does not agree, mean agree. Affirm does not mean, yes, I agree with you that climate change is a liberal hoax. No. But you can affirm and make them feel heard. Wow. That does sound really scary. Wow. You know, I've heard other people say that too. And then respond with a personal story. But in my experience, the folks that are saying that climate change is a liberal hoax are the same folks that have the biggest hand in their pot in the pie of continuing on with polluting and burning fossil fuels and continuing the climate crisis. Let me give you an example and share a personal story. And then redirect. Ask them about their lived experience. Have you ever experienced a time when someone said something that was in their self-interest? So you're moving away from the talking points and you're moving towards stories. It's important to remember that you're driving the conversation. You don't need permission to change the conversation. They can always end the conversation by closing the door. And you are taking away important opportunities to that resident by not asking them questions. Do not try to challenge their ideology, but steer the conversation back to their lived experiences. And we're going to skip forward to just one quick. Today, we're going to learn how to download. Which is safety. As you are continuing on in your conversations with folks, if you cannot redirect a conversation and you have tried multiple times, it is okay to end a conversation. It is okay to not continue a conversation that is not productive. It is okay to not continue a conversation that is not safe. Just want us to remember that best practice. Now let's talk a little bit about the framework and what it looks like when we're having these conversations. When you go out deep canvassing with us, you will receive a printed framework with ideas about how to talk about these issues. The highlighted sections are required questions, but the rest, it's just recommended language, make it your own. So we'll start with, hi, how are you? My name is Gretchen. I'm a volunteer with the Sierra Club. We're an environmental organization. And we're out talking to folks in the neighborhood about issues affecting our community. We're in this neighborhood specifically because Indian Mound Neighborhood and other community organizations have come together with the city of Kansas City to ask Evergy to close its Hawthorne coal plant, which is not too far from here. But so far, Evergy has refused. Are you familiar with this issue? What have you heard about it? The Hawthorne Power Center is one of the last coal-fired power plants in a major city. It emits 2.9 million tons of air pollution each year, which can make our uh, which can impact our health. How does that make you feel? And then this is the required question that makes deep canvassing very important. Can you tell me how much you think you have the ability to influence Evergy? On a scale of zero to 10, where zero is no power and 10 is a lot of power and five is some power, how much power would you say you have to influence Evergy? So this is the step one. This is introduction to the issue, building rapport and initial ratings. And this is just the framework. There's other things sprinkled in this first step, right? Like, oh, is that your daughter playing in the yard? What a cute puppy you have. I love your shoes. Whatever it is. Beautiful day we're having. And then sharing people, I'm not asking for money. I'm not here to ask you to join my religion. I'm not here to proselytize to you or judge you. Um, I'm here to hear about your experiences, but about this issue, not what you think about the new Tesla, not what you think about the Barbie movie. I want to hear what you think about your ability to influence Evergy and talk to you about Hawthorne Power Plant. 
The second part of your conversation is sharing a story. So you want to ask for a story around civic power. Do you believe you and your neighbors can come together to demand change? Tell me about a time you made a change in your community or at work or in your family. How did that feel? What did it look like? Say more about that. Say more about that is a really fun way to continue conversations and be curious. And it's still open-ended enough that people can continue the conversation with you without feeling like you're asking or prying. Then you want to tell them why you're here. I'm out here today because after over two years of advocacy, residents like us won the Kansas City Climate Action Plan. And now Evergy needs to listen to us and be a good neighbor. I've seen this work before. Or this is important to me because, and then you are sharing your story of experiencing power and delivering a concrete change that mattered to you. This does not have to be, I helped pass a law. This does not have to be, my community came together and we solved poverty or homelessness, right? This can be, my coworkers and I were really upset that they took the soda machine out of our office. This can be, when I was in college, the students got together and we really wanted to support the janitors. And so we asked the dean to raise their wage to a living wage. And I helped gather signatures. It's a story of how you're coming together. It's a story about what you're doing right now. You're talking to people in the community. And maybe you don't have a story yet. Maybe you just say, this is really important to me, and here's why. This is really important to me because I live in this neighborhood. My dad has asthma, and I'm really concerned about air pollution. I've seen what it's like when someone I love is struggling to breathe, and nobody should ever have to go through that. And then you want to ask, does that resonate with you? What's been on your mind as we've been talking? And get feedback from them. Try to find those points of connection. If they share a story, then you can say, wow, that was really powerful. It seems like when you and your class decided to get together and build a tree or, you know, <laughs> to get whatever it is, you know, uh, that that must, that was really powerful. How did that feel to be part of that movement? How did it feel to be part of those conversations? How did it feel to to engage and interact in that way. Um, here's a time that I had an experience like that. So this is the, you're sharing your stories. And then if there is some dissonance, if they're sharing a story of, yeah, this is the time when I and whatever community they're part of, my church and I got together and we created blankets for the homeless people in our community, then you're saying, well, on the one hand, you said that it doesn't feel like you have a lot of power to make a difference in your community with Evergy. But on the other hand, you and your Bible study group hand quilted 250 sleeping bags for homeless people in your community to combat homelessness. So it sounds like you recognize that when people get together, you can make local change on issues that seem like they're immovable. Does that sound right? And you want to help them process that conflict and that dissonance between I know I can make a change in my community and I've seen it done before versus I don't feel like I can. And then you can continue to share stories in my experience or did you know? And then you want to name what divides us. A challenge Kansas City is facing is that Evergy is refusing to listen to residents' demands and close this harmful coal plant. We know that closing Hawthorne will clean our air and save customers money, but Evergy is getting its way without resistance so it can fight against community goals and make more money. Even though Evergy is a big company and has lots of power, we know that we can win when we work together as neighbors. 
We have all the power to make a difference in our community. And then you want to finish up your conversation. You want to say, if you had an opportunity to make a difference in your community, would you? Given what we've talked about, how much power do you think you have now to influence energy over your community? Why is that the right number for you? And then you want to invite them to get involved. We just had a community meeting in November, but we're going to come back after the holidays and talk some more with other folks in the community. Do you want to join us? Great. What's a good phone number and email address? If no, that's okay. Would you be interested in attending other neighborhood meetings or connecting one-on-one? -on -one? So get their contact information. We also have a petition that folks can sign if that's what they're interested in doing. We will share this framework with you because we know that it's a lot beforehand. And the organizers are always able to help you practice out loud and help you understand how to have this conversation with folks before you get out on the doors. We will always make sure that you feel as informed and ready as possible, but this is a situation where practice makes perfect. You are exactly the right person to be making these conversations happen in neighborhoods because you care about this issue. So even if you're not perfect, that's okay because people appreciate folks that aren't professionals, that aren't robots. They want to hear from people who are real like them. And when you're done, data collection is your best friend. We use two ways to process our data. We use VAN, which is just an app that you, that you download on your phone, and we can always help you with that. It's where you'll find your lists of people to talk to and how to get to their homes, and it's how you'll track who you're talking to and what their answers were to your questions. And then we have a Google form. And the Google form is where you can leave more detailed information, like, is there anything that we should know about this resident? What kind of follow-up do they need? And you can leave us notes like, please mail this person something because they don't have email. Or this person says text is best, but they really are interested in having a one-on-one, -on -one, and we will follow up with them. You can always take notes on conversations or record them with consent. And we want you to have about 20 minutes with each person. Honestly, one good conversation an hour is a fantastic result with deep canvassing. And keeping this data ensures we are effective, that we're following up with people who want us to, want to hear from us, and that we're changing our tactics if we're not being successful. We want to ensure that you have a good experience and have what you need to be successful. So our data collection is, uh, is absolutely vital to that. And finally, take pictures. We are living in a world where if there isn't a picture, it didn't happen. So take pictures and share them with us with permission from your folks you're talking to. And we would love to have those and share them so that we can continue to can work in these communities and talk to people about what is important, protecting our families and protecting our future. We will share this video of how to use minivan, but it is very, very easy and we're gonna watch it briefly. And this is how you use the app on your phone. Today, we're gonna to learn how to download and use minivan. In your app store, you just type in minivan touch and then download the app, which looks like this. We're either gonna log in with an account you already have or create a new one. When the app downloads and it opens up, you'll be taken to the screen with that option. So let's look at it, what it looks like to create an action ID. So click create, and then you're just gonna enter some basic information your email, you'll make a password and put in your first and your last name. I actually already have an action ID account. So I'm going to go ahead and put that in using my password saver real quick. And I'm going to get texted a code to my phone to make sure it's really me. Just grab the number from your text and put it in. Next step is accept the privacy policy. And then enable location. So this just makes sure that the app works well for you and knows where you are when you're canvassing. And I got a text from my friend Hannah. 
And we're going to go ahead and enter in the list number. So we'll give you one at the time of your canvassing. This one I'm putting in is a sample list uh, that you can just use to start to mess around with the app and see how it works. I made a classic mistake, which is putting all the numbers in on one side of the screen, but you do have to split it up by the hyphen. Um, otherwise, it won't work. So type in the list number and click download list and then you're in. I just allowed notifications, got my canvassing safely reminder, and then I'm good to start. You'll get some sort of like tips or notifications from the app as you're using it, but you're pretty much good to go. So there's a couple options um, for how to view the addresses. You can use household view or map view. So that was household view and this is map view, which I prefer but it's really about whatever works best for you. So you can zoom in and zoom out and then find a house to go to. So let's choose this house where Jack T. Smith is living. There's a couple options here. You can see the script, details, notes, and the history of us contacting this person. Let's start with just script. If Jack is not home, then we'll mark them as not home. A nice thing about this app is that you can actually swipe right on a contact to mark the not home, which is just a little faster. So I've just showed you that example. Let's say Jack actually is home. So we'll take out the not home and we'll go ahead and start in on the script. The first question about support will mark Jack's response, strong Democrat. And then we'll go ask Jack what method of voting they're planning on using for the runoff. So let's say that Jack tells you that they want to use in-person election day voting. Well, you can see in the script here, we actually are hoping to get people to vote early in person instead um, because we want to make sure everyone has the opportunity to cast their vote. So let's say we convince Jack, we go back and change Jack's answer to early in person. Easy. The next question for Jack is about vote tripling. So we'll ask Jack to vote triple and then enter in um, that Jack did so. So we'll put yes. And then the last question is about volunteering. So let's say that Jack is down to volunteer, which is great. Then we pretty much are good to go. There are more details at the end of the script in case you need them. Then you'll zoom out um, and you'll sync your data. So I just press that little cloud button in the top. You can also check your progress on a list. You can see progress bar and other information about your list, which can be nice to know as you're going. Another way to sync your data is from that sidebar, you press sync and you get a big uh, awesome and then you're good to keep going. Your so that is just a really basic example um, and explanation of how to use minivan. We are always happy to go through minivan with you if you have further questions or if you can't figure it out. But once you start using it, you really do get the hang of it very easily and very quickly. Oh Today goodness. we're going to learn how to download and use. All right. This is the other form. This is the Google form. We want you to fill out both of these immediately after your conversations. The reason for that is because you are going to forget what people say. <laughs> if you have multiple conversations, you will forget. And I don't want you to be thinking, oh, was Jane the one that had the yellow puppy and was concerned about asthma? Or was that Jeff? Or was it Brenda that had the daughter with asthma and wanted a follow-up one-on-one? -on -one? So it's better to immediately record your information. It also allows more depth and complexity of data collection because it's going to be the front of your mind. And information is never, ever shared with other organizations. So you don't need to worry about, you know, sharing private information, but it does make following up with residents and community members much easier. Safety. We encourage you to go out in pairs, bring a friend, pair up with one of our organizers, but we do recommend you go out in pairs and stay in contact. Um, so one person might take the left side of the street while the other person takes the right. You might have one person talking and one person taking notes. Um, we encourage you not to enter homes. We never know who's been sick or, you know, uh, bed bugs are in France and all over the place. So just be thoughtful. Beware of dogs and wear appropriate clothing, footwear, and sunscreen. So when I say appropriate clothing, footwear, and sunscreen, I just mean be comfortable. If it's going to be 36 degrees outside, bring a jacket. Um, don't wear stiletto heels. Uh, just do what you need to do to be comfortable and not make yourself sick or hurt. 
I do want to note that safety and comfort are two different things. Deep canvassing conversations are intentionally difficult and challenging. You will meet people that disagree with you. You will meet people who refuse to change their mind or refuse to have a conversation with you. That's okay. That is different than a threat to your personal safety. We never want you to be in a situation or to not remove yourself from a situation that could be a threat to your personal safety. So if someone has a no soliciting sign on their door, you're not soliciting, you're just canvassing. So those are two different things. But if someone has a sign on their door that says, you know, I shoot people who knock on this door, maybe don't knock on that door. We want you to be thoughtful. We want you to be safe and we want you to have a good experience. So use your best judgment. So what's next? Get out there, knock on doors, take pictures, collect data. This is not traditional organizing and it's gonna be different. It's going to be harder and practice makes perfect. We also want to debrief with you. What worked well? What needs improvement? How did your skills grow or change? What would have been helpful for you to know before you were in the neighborhood that we could have done better? We want your feedback. We also want to hear from you as you move forward. If you have questions, if you want to talk about your story, if you want to review the framework, if you have questions, please reach out to us at any time. We are here for you to support you. We are grateful for your time and energy, deep canvassing. And thank you for helping us make this planet a better place. Have a great day.